in the first part of our talk, we revisited three moments in the Exodus narrative. Israel's slavery, their crying out, and the calling of Moses. And we reflected on what these moments might mean for us as individuals and as a people. In the second part, we continue with our story and we delve into three other moments and three additional insights to accompany us in our journeys. So what happens in the story? Moses is called and responding to the call after his fifth objection, he, he returns to Egypt. And what you have is an exchange between Moses and the Pharaoh. Moses tells the Pharaoh, the Lord says, let my people go. The Pharaoh refuses and you have a plague taking place. You have that pattern repeated for 10 times no? until after the 10th plague, the Egyptians and the Pharaoh finally let the Israelites go. So that's, that's where we are as far as the narrative goes. Finally, Israel marches out of Egypt and then ends up encamped by the sea. And then what happens? The text will tell us that the Egyptians change their minds. They ask, what have we done that we let Israel leave our service? The Egyptians and the Pharaoh changed their minds. Is it only the Egyptians and the Pharaoh who changed their minds? No. Because the text will also tell us that the Israelites as well changed their minds. They turn to Moses and they tell Moses, what have you done to us? Bringing us out of Egypt. Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to remain in Egypt and to serve the Egyptians rather than die in the wilderness. So the Egyptians and Pharaoh changed their minds, the Israelites changed their minds, which begs an interesting question. Why did they miss one another? Why the longing for one another? You know, it might be easy to begin by answering that question from the perspective of Egypt. Why did Egypt miss Israel? Because they no longer had slaves. Because they no longer had people who would fill in their needs. I mean, Egypt is a limited world. They needed the Israelites to secure the satisfaction of their needs. A more difficult question, I think, is the question, why did the Israelites miss Egypt? They had been slaves for the longest time. Now they had been freed. They marched out and were now encamped by the sea. And then they miss Egypt. And I think to answer that question, we will have to, in a sense, imagine ourselves in the scene. The Israelites are encamped. The Egyptians pursue them from behind. The Israelites look behind them, see the Egyptians. What do they feel? They're afraid. They look in front of them. They see the sea. They see the waters. What do they feel? They're afraid. They look behind them. They're afraid. They look in front of them. They're afraid. All around them, there's fear. Is it possible? that Israel longs for Egypt because of fear. And this brings us to our fourth insight. And I heard this insight from Father Benny Kalputura decades ago, and he said, what makes change difficult is fear. And he added, if you want to live in mediocrity, live in fear. When you think about it, no? is, is there a decision in the past that you were contemplating on making but no longer made because you were afraid? And, and, and looking back at that decision, is there a part of you that regrets not having made that decision? Is there a part of you that says, you know, I wish I, wish I had made that decision if only I was not afraid? No? Maybe my, my life would have, in a sense, taken a different turn. No? So fear. James Hollis, the psychoanalyst and author whom I mentioned in the first part, he would say, you know, fear governs much of our lives. 
standing up to our fear is perhaps the most critical decision necessary in the governance of life. I mean, reflecting on the pandemic, we're all afraid. We're all afraid. But I think people have different ways of standing up to the fear. James Hollis will say, you know, one of the most common ways fear can be in charge will be found in our flight from personal responsibility. What does one do when one is afraid? One blames others. One scapegoats. That's what the Israelites did. They turned to Moses and said, what have you done? Why did you bring us here? Didn't we tell you it would have been better for us to remain in Egypt as slaves? You reflect on what's happening in this pandemic, no? and you see so much scapegoating. There's always someone else to blame. It, it's so difficult to find leaders who will, in a sense, take responsibility and say, the buck stops with me. No? So when one is afraid, one, let's go for responsibility. I mean, early on in the pandemic, I mean, we had people hoarding goods. We had people, some of them in positions of power, in a sense, exposing others to risk. No? And in contrast, you had other people placing their lives on the line to save other lives. It's the same fear, but people react to it in different ways. No? Can we stand up to our fears? No? And Hollis will also say the other byproduct of fear is lethargy, the lack of energy, the lack of enthusiasm. No? The lack of the will to move forward, to dream, to imagine. No? And again, we see that so evidently in our trying times. No? And, and sometimes there is the temptation to simply give in to the fear, to be immobilized by the fear. And I think this is what Moses sensed with the Israelites. That's why he turned to them and said, Fear not, stand firm. See the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again. Moses uses the word see three times. And I think it was deliberate. Because you have to remember that what caused Israel's fear was what they looked at. What caused Israel's fear was what they saw. And Moses is telling them, do not look at the sources of your fear. Rather, revision, change what you're looking at. No. Rather than look at your fear, look at what the Lord will do for you today. And I think that brings us to our fifth insight. No? And the insight is to lead involves helping oneself and others see things in a new light. Why is Moses considered the leader prophet par excellence by the Israelites? Because he taught them to see themselves and to see reality in a new way. There's this lovely, lovely quote from Nelson Mandela. No? And he says, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. May your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. It's the same act of looking, but I can choose to look at my fears or I can choose to look to my hopes. And Mandela is saying, look to your hopes. Again, I think about what's happening in our context. And I wonder whether the primary way of proceeding is to make people fixate on their fears. How do you control people? Scare them. Scare them. When people are fearful, they are immobilized. So quell criticism. File cases. Legislate. Do anything and everything possible to actually keep people fearful. On the other hand, you have ordinary citizens and leaders who, in a sense, inspire us not to dwell on our fears, but to look to our hopes. And that's the invitation in this moment of the narrative. 
returning to the story, earlier we said that Israel was encamped by the sea. They looked behind them, saw the Egyptians, and were afraid. They looked in front of them, saw the waters, and they were afraid. Behind them, in front of them, all around them, they're afraid. When you reach a point in your life where all around you you're afraid, then you would have reached a point where you must now make a decision. Israel has reached the point where it must now decide. And how many options did they have? At least two. One option was to go back. To go back to the familiar. Even if that familiar was slavery. That's why they told Moses, why did you bring us here? Wouldn't it have been better to remain in Egypt as slaves? What's the second option? To cross the sea. What's the risk? They could, they could drown. They, they could die. Why do it then? What's the potential gain? Freedom. New life. But you won't know if there's freedom and new life at the other end unless you risk death by crossing the sea. And that, my dear friend, is the drama of all of our lives. At every point in our life, we have two options. One option is to go back to the familiar, even if the familiar is slavery. The other option is to move forward, risk death, to see whether there's life and freedom at the other end. And so the Israelites decide to cross. Which brings us to our sixth insight for the Exodus story. And, and the insight is that change happens only when we are willing to leave the familiar that enslaves behind. Israel crosses, and, and the text will tell us, and the people of Israel went into the midst of the waters, and the waters were a wall to them on the right and a wall to them on their left. Father Jean-Louis Ka, a Jesuit biblical scholar, he says, you know, in ancient times, whenever someone wants to orientate himself or herself, whenever someone wants to, in a sense, get a sense of bearing, a sense of direction, that person would look to the east, would look to the east. And when you look to the east, you have the south to your right, and you have the north to your left. And, and Father Ska proposes that when the text says that when the Israelites crossed, the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left hand. He says, could it mean that as they crossed the sea, they had the south to the right and the north to their left, which meant that the direction of their travel was from west to east. What might that mean? Father Ska goes on and says, you know, in the ancient Near East, the east was the gate of life, the place where light, the sun, defeats darkness and death. What was the west? It was the entrance into the underworld, the place of darkness, of death, of evil. So he, he would propose that if the Israelites were journeying from west to east, then they were traversing and fighting the forces of death, the forces of darkness, the forces of evil, so as to be born unto new life. And that's what the Exodus is all about. It's a journey from slavery to freedom, from darkness to light, from death to new life. And if that is what Exodus is all about, then as we said when we began this talk, Exodus is not just Israel's story. It is also the story of each and every one of us journeying from slavery to freedom, darkness to light, death to new life. So what might this imply for us? Again, James Hollis, the psychoanalyst and author, um, he says, you know, growing up requires two practices. First, 
we must learn to take responsibility for ourselves and stop blaming others, our parents, our significant others, society, the malevolent gods. And then he says, a second invitation is for us to continually look within, to gain greater awareness and understanding of, of who we are. Pope Francis, on the other hand, has this lovely, lovely quote, no? uh, and, and, and he says, you know, human history, our history, the history of every one of us, it's, it's never finished. It never runs out of possibilities. Rather, it is always opening to the new, to what until now we had never even imagined, to, to, to what seemed impossible. I, I remember in one talk when we came to this quote, there was a 78-year-old woman who raised her hand and said, you know, if that quote is true, then even at 78, I'm only just beginning. I'm only just beginning. There's this lovely, lovely quote from Meister Eckhart, no? who says, and suddenly you just know. It's time to start something new and trust the magic of beginnings. That's what the Exodus was. And the invitation is to reflect on our own journeys and to hopefully reflect on what sea or what newness the Lord is inviting you to enter into and cross at this point in your life. As, as we end this, this, this talk in the context of a pandemic, I think it might help us to remember that while this might be an end to something, it is also a beginning. And so I end with a quote from Arundhati Roy, who says, you know, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Journey gently, journey lightly, journey bravely, journey lovingly. Mm -hmm.